everyone. I'm Rachel. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm so happy to welcome you to this virtual experience at Versailles. Um, this virtual experience is part of the Tickets Awakening Weeks, which is a six week celebration of the reopening of more than 100 museums and attractions in six countries around the world. These venues have worked around the clock to reimagine their experiences and introduce new hygiene measures to make it safe for you to visit again. And now they're rolling out the welcome mat with these online experiences so that everyone can join the experience and reawaken cultural institutions worldwide. Uh, I see some of you already joining, uh, sharing in the chat where you're joining from us from. Please continue to do that. We're so happy to have people from all over the world be able to experience Versailles today. Um, this virtual experience will start soon, but as people are still joining us, I'll just first kick us off by sharing some logistical information about what to expect and how to use Zoom. So first of all, if you have any questions for the presenter, you can submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so just leave your questions there. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so your camera will not be on, but you can use the chat to communicate with your fellow attendees and with the speakers. You can share where you're joining us from or your reactions during the session by using the chat to message to all panelists and attendees. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties at all, you can use the chat to send a message to all panelists and we'll try to help you out as soon as possible. Uh, but largely, if you have any issues, just leaving and rejoining the webinar will probably solve them. Um, finally, this presentation will be recorded and we'll send out the recording to you quite soon uh, so you can share it with all your friends who maybe weren't able to join live. So now with those technical details out of the way, it's time to get to the experience. Today, we are thrilled to be joined by Laurent Salome, who has been the director of the Musée National des Châteaux de Versailles since January of 2017. Um, Versailles really needs no introduction. It's among the most popular sites in Europe, and it also houses one of the largest collections of paintings, sculpture, and decorative arts in France. The museum produces ambitious temporary exhibitions and has been active in contemporary art since 2008 with invitations to major international artists. And today's host for our uh, experience is just as impressive. So prior to his current position at Versailles, Laurent Salome has been the director for curatorial affairs at the Grand Palais, where he was mainly responsible for the exhibition program of the Grand Palais. And as the director of two major regional fine arts museums in Rennes and Rouen before that, he had already curated more than 80 exhibitions. He began his career as deputy director of the Musée de Grenoble, which allowed him to supervise the construction of a spectacular new building and organize the transfer of the collections. Originally a specialist of French 17th century art, he has been active in many different fields, including 19th century modern and contemporary art. So without any further ado, I am so happy to hand it over to our host, Laurent, who will transport us all to Versailles today. Laurent, take it away. Hello, well, good morning, good night, good evening. I don't know, I'm really thrilled to welcome you here in Versailles. It's not a very easy task for me. It's a challenge that I'm getting used to more and more in those times when we want to communicate and uh, uh, share as much as we can this uh, amazing place, uh, which is Versailles. So I think we have uh, just time for a quick tour of the State Department. When I'm saying a quick tour, just to see that part of the palace takes about 40 minutes, and I'm trying to control this, uh, this visit, but uh, I have to say it will be probably something like 10% of the palace that we can see that way. Uh, Versailles is full of other places, secret places, private apartments, and then there's Trianon, there's three uh, palaces in fact here in, in the gardens of Versailles. So it's a kind of uh, uh, little insight of Versailles and I'll try to make you wish to, to come and, and visit it. So today we try to imagine um, a run through these state apartments starting from this huge salon, the Salon de Hercule, Hercules room. Uh, the name comes from the hero who is here uh, reigning on this place, uh, Hercules arriving in the Olympus uh, on the ceiling of this uh, salon. But this room, like many other places in Versailles, had a complicated story. It's been used for different um, things. 
It has been a chapel for a long time, uh, the fourth chapel of a series of six, and the, the actual great royal chapel was the sixth chapel of the palace. Um, and then it was called the Great Marble Salon, and you can see that it has an amazing symphony of marbles decorating it. And this was all made, in fact, as a kind of uh, wonderful shrine for a masterpiece, that painting by Veronese, because the Sun King, Louis XIV, was very proud, of course, of that gift that was made to him by the Republic of Venice, one of the greatest paintings by Veronese. And in a way, the whole room was designed as a, a frame and a shrine for the painting. And you see the frame itself is amazing. It was sculpted by the best sculptors of the time. So the place already explains something about Versailles. We always think of it as a place of power and absolute power because with Louis XIV, we're talking about serious absolute monarchy. But it's also a place for art, for meditation, a place for a relation to nature and a place for love also. And you'll see that we have lots of symbols of love everywhere in this, in this palace. So from this big uh, room of Hercules, we start uh, the, the series of the state apartments, the Grand Appartement. And there's a wonderful little room. I mean, little, of course, it's, everything's relative here. Um, which is at the beginning of this series of the Grand Appartement, the Salon de l'Abondance, Abundance Room. It's named like this because there's an allegory of abundance and wealth and, and generosity on the ceiling. And it was, um, it used to be the entrance to a very secret and prestigious uh, space of the palace, which was just behind these doors. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was Louis XIV's private collector's apartment. And this is where he had all his masterpieces, paintings, precious objects. And this is why this room now is a, an evocation of that richness of collections. But normally it was just a, um, an entrance to the collector's apartment of Louis XIV. Now it has some of our most beautiful pieces of furniture and paintings and uh, um, and bronzes from the Renaissance, for instance. And this is just a, like an antechamber to the beginning of the, the state apartment. And I was saying that Versailles is not only about power. Of course, as you see, maybe some of you have been here already, uh, this is so magnificent and large and enormous that, of course, it's meant to make the visitor feel very small, very weak and tiny in comparison with the power of, of the Sun King. But at the same time, it's all about pleasure. And the first room uh, of this uh, apartment is Venus room. So it's interesting that they had chosen Venus as the goddess of love to introduce the visit to the state apartment. It can, the kind of paradox, but that's part of the charm of Versailles, of course. So I, I, I'm, I won't have time today to show you all the details, but of course, each of the ceilings tell the story of the goddess who is representing the, I mean, who is the uh, master of, of each place. And then you have extremely rich sculpted decoration, sculptures, sculpture of, of Louis XIV himself, we have several uh, wonderful images of him in this apartment. So Versailles is not only the palace of Louis XIV. As you know, it's been the seat of French government until the revolution. So that was also Louis XV and Louis XVI. But in these great state apartments, we have more of a taste of Louis XIV, unlike the private apartments, which look much more like the way that they were at the end of the 18th century and in the time of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. But even in these large apartments, you'll see some traces of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, because what we'll see at the end is the famous queen's bedroom. So those um, rooms of the Grand Appartement, the state apartments, are named after planets. And in fact, that's a very uh, poetic way of organizing a palace. Each room is a planet, so it can be Venus, Diana, which is connected with the moon, and then we'll have Mars, Apollo, Jupiter. So this is all um, something in connection with the cosmos, and there's something very philosophical also with the, the concept of, of Versailles. 
Uh, here we have Diana's room. Diana is very important in, in Versailles mythology because she's the moon, she's the goddess of the moon, and she's the sister of the sun Apollo. And as you all know, Louis XIV progressively identified himself with the sun. So Diana was like his sister. And in the park, we have wonderful fountains and sculptures telling that story between, uh, between Apollo and Diana. An important thing in this Diana uh, room is the portrait, the celebrated portrait of Louis XIV by Bernini. And it's also a way to recall that Versailles is deeply Italian in its first uh, atmosphere. Of course, we like to, to say that it's a pure French style, French architecture, and it's a symbol of French genius, but it's very Italian. And this series of Planets were inspired by Palazzo Pitti in Florence, which has the same idea of mythological organization of the palace. And the great Italian artists were, of course, very popular in France. And Louis XIV was very happy to commission his portrait to uh, Bernini. And it's a, he was still very young in this portrait. It's, it's very lively, very seducing, very far from the frightening, powerful king that we'll see later. But of course, you cannot be always thinking of the moon of night and love. You have to think about war and, and Versailles is a place of power. And after the, the, the room of Diana comes Mars and Mars is the god of war, of course. So here you have the most, uh, the largest uh, room of this series uh, that formed the, the state apartment. You have wonderful paintings. Uh, portraits, portraits of kings and queens. Here you have Mary Leszczynska, the wife of Louis XV. The the uh, important paintings by Vouet uh, above the, the doors. In fact, in, in each room of Versailles, you would have to spend two or three hours to see all the paintings, all the details, all the furniture. And that's always the problem. In fact, if you want to plan a serious visit of Versailles, you should allow two months full time, and then you have a chance to see everything especially if you want to also see the palaces of Trianon. Here we have our first example of a bedroom. Um, you know, the concept of a bedroom is very different in those days and, and in official palaces than what we think is a bedroom. Of course, we're talking about an official state bedroom. So that's a place where uh, official events take place, especially the simple fact of the king waking up is, is a very important ceremony and only a very specific categories of people are allowed for each little um, moment of the waking up, the lever du roi. Uh, so this has been one of the bedrooms. In fact, what you see here is a restitution of one state of this room, but the bedroom has been in, in the other, uh, in the room just afterwards. And then Louis XIV, as we will see later, decided to build a new large bedroom, which is now the famous king's bedroom uh, in, the, um, in the perspective of the palace on the other side. So there's a very complicated story of bedrooms. And to make it even more complicated, this bed is a 19th century bed. Uh, commissioned by another king, but King Louis-Philippe, who never uh, ruled over Versailles, but was a revolutionary king. He was the Roi des Français, so that means not, not really king of France. And he turned Versailles into a museum. And when he created that museum, he recreated all those state apartments, but changed all the rest of the palace into a museum with thousands of portraits and sculptures and objects. And this is something that he did to recreate the bed of Louis XIV, because of course, the bed had been burnt at the revolution. What you can hardly believe when you see Versailles now is that it's been completely empty and abandoned after the revolution. And we progressively acquired everything we could that was um, lost all over the world. I mean, the, the British bought a lot of furniture and then a lot of things went to the United States. We have pieces of furniture from Versailles all over the world and we try to progressively make them come back 
to the palace, but it's been a long, long way. And people who remember Versailles 30 years ago know that it was almost empty. So now we're not there anymore. We have very important things uh, here. We've recreated the beds and we acquired um, the important historic pieces that were not lost, like this very famous clock. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I cannot make it work for you, but it, it has an amazing mechanism. Maybe I can try to show you. Not the mechanism, but just you can imagine what it does when, when, it, when it's time. So you have this wonderful clock, and when you come to the, the hour, uh, there's a music automat that starts. The door opens, and the king comes out of the door, and then the clouds open, and you have uh, la renommée, that's the glory that comes out of these clouds and uh, hands a, a crown of laurel over the head of Louis XIV. So there's quite a grand show going on for each hour. And it, it's one of the most extraordinary objects of this, of this room. But I could, I could show you many other little objects, but we have to almost run. So as I said, this is also the palace of Louis XV and Louis XVI. Here you have uh, Louis XV, but you also have Louis XVI in the next room. They've all lived in the same rooms, used the same bedrooms. And the only thing that they could change was the private part of the palace. And this has been an enormous work to recreate private apartments, especially Louis XV. This one uh, couldn't stand sleeping in, in the official bedroom and really needed to create a new, more intimate apartment with its little bedroom. This is an, another example of a room that doesn't look exactly like it was before. There has been a bedroom at some point, but then it's been mainly the throne room. And of course, at the revolution, just like beds, which were considered the symbol of monarchy, thrones were destroyed. So we, we have ordinary furniture that has survived, but thrones have not survived except for very few exceptions. So here you have just the place for the throne. You have the tapestry, but you have to imagine this beautiful throne with a wonderful carpet. In fact, we have the project of redoing the carpet because we have the design, which is preserved in the archives. So this is always a work in progress, you know, Versailles. So in a couple of years, you'll have something very spectacular here with a new carpet, but we might not redo the throne. That would be a little bit risky. Um, I have to say we just have one little bad luck today because just this morning we had to take away the most famous painting of the palace, which is normally here. Here you have a very nice portrait of Louis XV, but normally this is the place of the celebrated portrait of Louis XIV that you all know with the big wig and those beautiful legs with, this, with white stockings and the, the red heels, you know, the very famous portrait of Louis XIV, but we had to prepare it for a grand exhibition that we're preparing on the painter, the painter who did this painting, Yacinthe Rigaud, and this will uh, open on November 17th, and we're going to restore the painting before, and all the, the masterpieces by Rigaud that we have in the, in the palace are being prepared for the, this exhibition. Very good opportunity to come to, to Versailles. <clears throat> Here you begin to have a feeling of something very special compared to the apartment that we've gone through, which was a very spectacular but still an Italian type apartment. Here you have a huge salon at the angle facing the north and the west. It's the war salon. And in fact, everything is symbolic in Versailles. You have the king's apartment leading to the, the room of war. And then on the other side, we'll see the apartment of the queen on the side of peace. In fact, it's not that the queen is linked to peace and the king is linked with war. It's rather than you have an, a kind of natural movement from war to peace. And between war and peace, what do we have? We have the hall of mirrors that we'll go through right, right after the, uh, afterwards. But this um, room, the Salon de la Guerre, the room of war, 
is one of the most beautiful places in the palace. It has already a lot of mirrors to make it look more um, bright and open and something like, like a place in the middle of nature. You have wonderful views on the gardens. Uh, of course, a beautiful ceiling. I don't know if we can see it right, but it has beautiful paintings by Charles Lebrun, the first painter of Louis XIV. And a, an example of those masterpieces of sculpture that we have here in Versailles, this big uh, representation of uh, Louis XIV as a victorious warrior on horseback and the prisoners on, on, on the lower part of the, the panel. This was all made by Antoine Coisevaux, the best sculptor of the time of Louis XIV. And you see that, the, of course, there's the main sculpture, but all the ornaments, all these figures are so beautiful. The mask of this man with the lion's um, uh, skin and, and uh, paws and the casts and, and the warriors, the slaves, the, all the details have the same quality and they were all made by the best artists of the time. So progressively from this large room, you discover the perspective of the Hall of Mirrors, which of course everybody knows. I have to say, because it's a personal obsession, it would look much nicer without all those lights and those chandeliers, everybody loves the chandeliers in the Hall of Mirrors, but you have to imagine it without those chandeliers. They were installed only for uh, special events like uh, marriages, uh, especially, not especially, but only for the marriage of the Dauphin, so the, the, the son of the king or the future king. And so that happened three times <clears throat> in the whole time when Versailles was the seat of the government. Um, so I always say it's like keeping your, uh, your Christmas tree in the middle of your uh, salon all year round because you think it's nice. And I think it would look much nicer without those chandeliers because what you see here is the Sistine Chapel of French art. It's a wonderful space and volume with the, the ceiling telling all the story of the reign of Louis XIV with a big change compared to what we've seen before in the, in the apartment. Uh, it was previous to that, it was all about planets and the mythology and gods and uh, all the symbols that were usually uh, represented in palaces. And the novelty here is that Louis XIV imagines to tell his own modern story on the ceiling. So he's represented like people used to represent gods, of course. Then. No comment is necessary on that. Uh, and he created one of the most spectacular spaces existing in the world, entirely dedicated to his own glory. So it would be interesting to see all the subjects, all, all the different moments of his uh, uh, ruling detailed on this, uh, this ceiling, which was, of course, painted by Charles Lebrun. <clears throat> Another really charming thing in this Hall of Mirrors is those other types of chandeliers, the torcher, I'm not sure about the English word for this. These were not from the time of Louis XIV, but the end of the reign of Louis XV, so we are in the, in the year 1770. And um, those were a new way to, to create the atmosphere of the gallery, but you didn't see those in the time of Louis XIV. You also have to imagine curtains, so it, it had something much more uh, solemn and impressive in the origin. Um, for great political events, Louis XIV would um, have his host come here in the gallery. For instance, uh, the ambassadors, they would be received here. He was at the end of the gallery, there was a throne and a very impressive, you can imagine the ambassadors coming all the way to uh, Louis XIV. It was quite impressive. And of course, I shouldn't forget to speak about the mirrors because the, the great uh, originality of this gallery is to have all those mirrors, uh, which at the time, that is at the end of, of the 17th century, we are around 1680, uh, were the most precious, difficult things to, to make. And uh, the king created a manufacturer 
especially to be able to have those mirrors created in France. It was a specialty of Venice in particular at that time. Um, in Belgium too, they knew how to, in the Flanders, they knew how to make mirrors, but uh, that was the development of a new industry of mirrors in France. And most of the mirrors you have here are still the original ones from, from the beginning. Very few have been replaced. Behind the, the Hall of Mirrors, of course, I'm not sure we've seen it on, on the images, but you have the, the view on the, on the gardens and the, the Grand Canal. <clears throat> So that would be another visit, but then we, as I said, we need many hours to have a nice tour of the gardens. Um, and on the other side, we have the inside of the apartments, what we call the appartement du roi, which is not really a private apartment, but a, a more um, uh, reduced space where only important people and ministers would come. Um, and uh, in this, Appartement du Roi, Louis XIV decided to create the new bedroom in 1701 that we'll see just uh, afterwards. But for instance, this is the Salle du Conseil, where he would receive his ministers and work on the, the affairs of the government. Um, so you see it still has a very official feeling, but it's not exactly the same atmosphere as, as the great appartement. You have an interesting piece of furniture here. It's not that it's such a beautiful object. It's a, an early 18th century desk. But the important thing is that this is the desk on which the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. So the end of World War I um, was signed on this desk. And not here, but in the Hall of Mirrors, there was a, a special scenery that was organized with the desk in the middle of the Hall of Mirrors. So that's something very moving, even though it's not the most beautiful object we have here. Not so bad, though. <clears throat> here is the great king's uh, bedroom. So the new bedroom imagined by Louis XIV in 1701. So this bedroom is facing east. And it's right in the middle of the palace, so you have a wonderful perspective. We're just doing restorations of the windows, so they're not completely clean. It's because we changed the glass um, this morning. Um, and so you have the marble yard, so that's what remains of the old palace, the, the castle of, the, of Louis XIV's father, which was just a little hunting lodge, which has been changed a lot, but that shows you the size of the, the primitive palace and then all the development of the palace and the perspective to the east. So the king wakes up facing east, east being the place where the sun rises, so the comparison is, is perfect. Um, you have his portrait on the, on the mantelpiece of uh, the fireplace. And the whole decoration is original. I mean, all the sculpture that has been this uh, fabric recreated from a uh, historic uh, model and then maybe a little too high for us wonderful paintings by Valentin de Boulogne in the attic of this room with uh, um, images of the apostles but Louis XIV was absolutely a passionate collector so this place was full of great masterpieces of French Italian Flemish art uh, it was really a, a place for art So we'll reach the Hall of Mirrors again with this little way out in, through the, the bedroom. This is a beautiful place also with an interesting painting by Nocre, which shows you the royal family uh, dressed as the gods of the Olympus. So that really is connected to what I was saying. There's a complete connection between modern history and mythology. So each of them is compared to a special god or a hero of, of the mythology, but you have all, everybody, the, the king, the king's brother, the children, the, the queens, etc. So it's a, a very charming and explicit painting. 
this was a very, there would be a lot to say about this, this important room, which is where people would wait before they were uh, admitted to the king's bedroom. Quite lucky we have a nice sunlight in, in the Hall of Mirrors now, but it's always beautiful anyway, even when the weather is gray, the, the Hall of Mirrors is always so poetic. You have to imagine that it, it looks very, no, I was going to say it looks simple, maybe not. But in fact, when you see the sculpted decoration of this gallery, it took, it took years to the best sculptors to do all these little angels and putties, the trophies, all the symbols of war, and then all the fake uh, sculpture made by the painters. So it's a mix, you see, you, you don't really, See where the where the limit is between painting and sculpture. It's a very intricate and complicated decoration. And then it had lots of antique sculptures and modern sculpture together, busts of Roman emperors, uh, classic sculptures. So it, it was a kind of um, something trying to escape time and with the idea of an eternal power. Of course, the reference to the Roman Empire, as well as uh, the reference to Italy, so it was a, a king for a new world. And the other end of this Hall of Mirrors is the Salon de la Paix, uh, the Peace Room, with another beautiful ceiling by Le Brun. So on this ceiling, you don't see the countries of Europe at war with France, but you see peace everywhere, everywhere, but of course, because France was victorious and France rules over whole Europe as a whole. Also, you know, of course, it's always a very simple um, message in, in all those paintings. It's all about power and the, the complete power of France. And here you have a beautiful painting by Le Moine. So that's after uh, Louis XIV. This was painting uh, under the reign of Louis XV. Uh, with you see the peaceful king bringing peace to the world and, and all the benefits of peace. And as always, this uh, harmony of all different marbles. We had a wonderful big book recently published on the marbles of Versailles. You have all the variety of the most beautiful marbles from the Pyrenean, from Flanders, from Italy, uh, the Campan, the Sarancolin, the uh, the marble of France in, in Belgium. And that's something very fascinating, this need for marble. And Louis XIV was able to stop a, a battle or to have a, the, the prog program of a war changed to have the marble delivered properly because it was needed for the palace. So from Belgium, for, I mean, modern, modern Belgium, that means Flanders. They would need the marble and the war would stop for a moment to have the marble come down to, uh, for the building of Versailles. So that was quite an important thing for them. On the south side of the palace, you have this beautiful lake uh, over that place called the Pièce d'eau des Suisses. And what you cannot see from the palace because it appears as a kind of surprise when you go further, you have the Orangerie with a wonderful garden where, where they take out all the orange trees and all the exotic trees. So if you could walk out to, to this little um, balustrade, you would see the Orangerie, which is one of the most uh, uh, wonderful places of the park. And this room of peace, of course, it's part of the State Department and it could be used for very official events. Uh, but it was also used by the queen as a, an extra room for her apartment. Maybe she found her apartment a little bit too tiny. Uh, but it, it, this is because it's just next to the queen's bedroom. In fact, what we do when we visit the palace is to see the, the, queen's, the king's apartment the right way, but the queen's apartment the wrong way. Normally, you don't see the, the bedroom first. You have a 
a series of rooms. You have the guard room first, then antechamber number one, antechamber number two. You have different places before you arrive to the bedroom. And as I said before, the bedroom is not just to sleep, it's to have a, a very official social life. And it's the final point for people at the court to arrive to the bedroom. So we take it the wrong way, but that's what we have to do. Otherwise, it's too complicated. So directly, we enter the queen's bedroom. So I think this is more or less everybody's favorite place in the palace. I'm not sure why, because there are many other places that could be your favorite. But in a way, it's easy to understand because bedrooms are always the favorite because they've, there's a feeling of a normal human existence rather than a big hall, and a gallery, the minister's room, etc. Etc. A bedroom is something more intimate, and you, uh, as big as it might be. And this one, of course, is very moving because it's strongly connected with uh, one of our most popular characters here in Versailles, Queen Marie Antoinette. Um, Marie Antoinette has become a kind of uh, myth, and she became a martyr after she was killed during the revolution. And her, her popularity progressively rise, rose during the 19th century. And at the end of the 19th century, you know, Empress Eugénie uh, was a big admirer of Marie Antoinette, and she co contributed to, to make her become a very uh, popular uh, character. And now, in, in our days, she remains a very popular universal character, which is funny because that in her time she was there was so much controversy about her she was not particularly popular she was at the beginning when she was young and then she was deeply hated by all the french people and progressively she became this popular woman again anyway now she's the most famous of all with louis the 14th marie antoinette is the second most famous probably in the palace and uh too many people think that she was the wife of Louis XIV. And of course, when you visit Versailles, it can get a bit confusing because you have all those different time layers together. And it's particularly the case here because we call it the queen's bedroom, but it could be the, the bedroom of uh, Marie-Thérèse, the, the Spanish queen wife of Louis XIV. Nobody ever speaks about her. She was a very discreet, not very spectacular queen. Uh, it was also the, the bedroom of Mary Leszczynska, the Polish wife of Louis XV. And she has been a queen of France for 42 years, which is enormous. And yet nobody knows her anymore. And then she's not very present in the palace because then came Marie Antoinette, the wife of Louis XVI. And she changed so many things in the palace that now everywhere you have a feeling of Marie Antoinette, and that's even more true in the little private apartments that we cannot see today, but which are completely the, the realm of Marie Antoinette. So you see her here. We, we have her portrait in the bedroom, although, of course, in her days, she wouldn't have her own portrait on the chimney. But for us, it's a way to have the, the occupant of the, of the room present uh, for our visitors. But all the rest is completely um, in the, the way it was when Marie Antoinette was using this place just before the revolution. This extraordinary fabric on the walls and the bed has been rewoven from the original um, pieces that have been uh, preserved. So it's exactly uh, the, the fabric that was uh, uh, decorating this, this room. The beautiful piece of furniture that you have here, the Ser Bijou, Ser Bijou, so in English that means the, the jewel cabinet of the queen. I think maybe we could exceptionally try to get closer to the Ser Bijou just for you. Normally visitors don't do that, but it's such an extraordinary object with those neoclassical figures in, in gilded bronze and uh, paint, and the parts are painted on glass and mother of the pearl, 
um, cameos, all kinds of very precious uh, decorations. It was made by uh, a renowned uh, cabinet maker, Schwert Seger, one of the uh, favorite for uh, Marie Antoinette. And it's a perfect example of the taste of Marie Antoinette for luxury, extreme luxury, but also a kind of uh, elegance of simple taste. That's what everybody loves. And finally, this is the 18th century that everybody loves and for uh, in the 19th century. And even today, that's, that's considered the, the, the top of the quality of uh, 18th century um, handcraft. So the bed, of course, <clears throat> the spectacular bed which has been recreated because it was burnt at the revolution, of course, but it still has, it's difficult to see because it has this little protection on it, but it's the original bed cover. So that's, this is what we have been able to use to recreate all the decoration of the, of the room with the famous lilac motif. And the ceiling is a very complex mix of different periods because it was designed like this already for the first uh, queen using that bedroom, Queen Marie-Thérèse. Uh, and then it was redesigned for Mary Leszczynska. So the style is mainly uh, the style of uh, Louis XV and Mary Leszczynska. That's what we call the rocaille style or rococo if you use the international world word. Uh, so all the the wood carvings of the walls and the ceiling are uh, uh, rocaille and it's more um, Louis the Fifteenth, except for the angles where you have these very impressive sculptures with the double-headed eagles of of um, Austria, and that of course was made for uh, Marie Antoinette. So you have a mix of all successive queens. Um, who left their own uh, mark in this uh, in this ceiling? The furniture is, of course, very precious. You have tapestries. The portraits above the mirrors, which look like paintings, are in fact tapestries with a very unique technique made by Cosette of Beauvais tapestry. Very precise and very impressive. And the whole room was rest restored. A few months ago, we reopened the, the Queen's apartment in April 2019. It was rather a, a sad um, uh, day for us because it was, there was a lot of excitement after all we did in these apartments to reopen them on April 15. But that was the very day when Cathedral Notre Dame burnt in Paris. So that, that was a very, very strange day. Uh, it was a great day in Versailles, but in the middle of our party for the reopening, we saw everybody looking at their iPhones and seeing Notre Dame burning. So quite a strange memory. Anyway, so I think that's about the, all we can see in the time that we had the, uh, for us. So what I suggest is we go back to a more sunny place, which is the Salon de la Paix, the Peace Room. And uh, if you have any questions, if I can help, help understanding or explaining better what I've done, because it's really not so easy to have these tour on myself, not knowing exactly who's listening to me and what you would like to know. Um, of course, don't hesitate, and it will be a great pleasure to, to help you, hoping that, of course, you come and join us as soon as possible to have a tour of this amazing palace. Yes, and we have quite a few questions that have come in for you, Laurent, or uh, more than 30, so we're not going to be able to get to them all, but people can continue uh -huh. putting their questions there and we'll get to the ones that we can. Um, I'd love to start with a question from Anne-Sophie, who wants to know, for you personally, where is the most wonderful room in the palace? <clears throat> I'm afraid it might be a room that we haven't seen today because the, those private apartments are so wonderful, but they can be visited in, in guided tours with, with a little group. And there's a room called the Cabinet de la Méridienne, which is in, in Marie Antoinette's private apartment, small room with a place for the sofa, and it was really made for her to rest. 
and you see all this palace is so impressive and but but the, the life uh, at court was so difficult so hard and especially of course for the king and the queen and marie antoinette needed so much to be alone and she created that room which is so beautiful i mean the, all the decorations with little symbols of love you have roses and little hearts with arrows in them and all, all things just to rest dream think about her own private life her children etc so maybe that would be my favorite but i also like some little places in trianon trianon is a wonderful place also a place where the uh, king louis the 14th to begin with wanted to have some privacy and uh, um, an easier life than here in versailles it sounds beautiful um, Michelle wants to know, how are the tapestries and artworks maintained without a climate-controlled environment? Well, we do have a rather well climate-controlled environment now. It's quite new and it's rare in a big palace like this, but this whole part of the Queen's apartment and um, the one half of the central part of the building has been now climate-controlled which doesn't solve the problem for tapestries. When, uh, of course, the solution, like always, is to have a, a rotation. We show them for a while and then we put them back in storage and we change. And we have to organize programs of changing the decoration of rooms because, of course, tapestries are among the most fragile. But when we have some tapestries completely necessary, like the little ones we've seen in the Queen's bedroom, then we control the light very much. I mean, the climate is okay now in the queen's bedroom and the light, we have the curtains closed all the time because, because of those pieces of fabric. Great. And uh, someone else wants to know, where did the staff live? So the gardeners, maids, et cetera, did they also have rooms in the palace or did they live elsewhere? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. It really depends what you call the staff because we have all kinds of staff in a in a palace like this a uh, large part of them lived here when they were attached to a particular person you had what it was called les maisons the maison du roi de la, la reine the dauphine the dauphin and so the the, the femme de chambre uh, they would live with their masters inside the palace there was also um, a big building called the Grand Commun with hundreds of uh, little apartments for the staff. But then there was a, such a need for aristocrats to live at the court that progressively those servants' apartments were changed into uh, aristocrats' apartments who preferred to have a better apartment there than live in a ridiculous little place here. Because, you know, the, the cliche is, but it, it's a true thing that m the most powerful families, they would have enormous castles in France, but when they came at the court, they would have to live in a, in a little room of 10 square meters. So it was all very complex. And of course, the gardeners have had different places in the gardens. And there were lots of buildings in the whole city of Versailles with different administrations working for the, for the king. Um, people working with horses, the horse stables, the dogs, all kinds of activities, the menu plaisir for theater and, and events. So they were always buildings everywhere. It, it's like a huge city. Amazing. And then on a different note, Amy wants to know, is there a missing piece from Versailles that the museum would particularly like to get its hands on? Yes, there are many missing pieces, <laughs> many very important missing pieces. And fortunately, most of them are in museums. I and mean, some of them are in private collections, so we can still hope that we might be able to buy them someday, or maybe some uh, philanthropist who might want to give them to the palace. But some of the most important ones are in major international museums at the Metropolitan or in, uh, in Russia, in the Hermitage, and all in Great Britain, of course, quite a lot. Some very important things in the Royal Collection in, in Windsor, for instance. Um, so unfortunately for, for a large part of them, we'll never have them back here, but we're still hoping to, and every year we manage to acquire things from Versailles and finally come back. Great. Um, Elaine wants to know, do you have a favorite view in the gardens, a place that lifts your spirits? 
Um, I have many, of course, but for instance, I, I love the groves, you know, the park, the main, main park designed by Le Nôtre, which is all à la française, so very uh, geometrical, has these little groves which are closed, which are like little woods with beautiful fountains and sculptures inside. And there's one, for instance, dedicated to Enceladus, the giant who wanted to attack the gods and then finally was crumbled under the rocks that he was trying to, to throw to, to, to the gods. So this is one of the most beautiful ones. And also the Colonnade is another grove, very spectacular, very poetic. It's like a little place for, for, to, for dreams. And maybe also I would say Trianon, the Grand Trianon has this incredible thing in the middle of the palace. It, it's um, Peristyle, so a, a series of columns. And you go from one half of the palace to the other through the, uh, you have to go outside. It's very, it's very original. And from that place between the columns, you have the view and the gardens of Trianon, uh, which in the time of Louis XIV was the most beautiful with the most extra extravagant flowers and things. And then they're still very beautiful. That does sound beautiful. Um... Robert would like to know, is the balcony in the king's bedroom, the balcony where Marie Antoinette stood when they stormed the palace? He wants to know if, if the balcony is? Uh, where Marie Antoinette stood when, the, when the, the people stormed the palace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, oh, the balcony is, yes, it's the one from the king's bedchamber where we were. That's absolutely the balcony, yes, I didn't understand. I, um, which is the central window of the palace. This is where they appeared to the people. Great. And then Marilyn wants to know, what is your favorite work of art in Versailles? Lots of tough questions uh, for you today. <laughs> yeah, it's very tough. I have to, I always choose, paint, choose paintings because I'm a painting specialist, but I, it could be a piece of furniture. But the ceiling of Hercules room where we were at the beginning is something extraordinary. It's poetic, it's grand, and it has a very moving story because the painter was so exhausted when he finished his work, which was his masterpiece is Francois Lemoyne. It's not very well known now, although in my opinion it's as important as Boucher and all the great French painters. So he was so exhausted that he got depressed and killed himself just after he finished his work and became premier peintre du roi. So it was all achieved glory, you know, the peak of his career and he committed suicide because maybe he had created something too big, too, too beautiful. Wow. Um, on a very different note, Maria wants to know, is it true that we can buy vegetables from the garden of the palace? Well, you cannot actually buy vegetables. There, there's a place called the Potager du Roi, which is not part of the palace, but it has a different administration. It used to be the, 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 the vegetable garden of the king. It's in Versailles, where, where you can buy vegetables. And what we do here in Versailles, in Trianon, in the Queen's uh, vegetable gardens, is produce very good vegetables and, of course, completely organic, uh, used by um, good restaurants, and especially Alain Ducasse, the chef Ducasse, who uses them in his great restaurants here and in Paris and elsewhere. So we do have some nice vegetables. Amazing. Um, Kenneth wants to know, if there were no restrictions, to what time period would you like to restore the chateau? Uh, for example, pre-revolution or the chateau of Louis XIV, uh, what time period would you choose? Well, that's a very difficult question. In fact, the, a solution has been found many years ago already. And the, uh, the idea is that we try to recreate or to show as much as possible the way the, the chateau was at the revolution. So on October 6th, 1789. But of course, we cannot do that everywhere. Uh, the place has been changed dramatically in the 19th century. Louis Philippe, King Louis Philippe in the, the 1830s changed it into a museum. So lots of apartments were destroyed, were dismantled. 
So it's not always possible to, to have the place the way it was at the revolution. And sometimes you, are, you have the temptation to have a more Louis XIV place. For instance, the God's room of, of the queen, which we haven't seen, is still exactly the way it was during the reign of Louis XIV. Well, because a God's room doesn't change that much. So when we have a place with, uh, with a strong presence of that moment, the, I mean, the origin of Versailles, the 17th century, we try to keep it. But normally, the rule is 1789. Great. Uh, a couple questions on the building of Versailles. One person wants to know how many years did it take to build Versailles? Well, it, it has never been finished, so you could say it's still going on. I mean, we're not finishing things that have never were made, although, yes, we, we did. For instance, the great staircase uh, called Escalier Gabriel, that was planned under the reign of Louis XV and never finished, was finished in 1980, but that's an exception. Uh, in the reality, the main building started in, I mean, you know, it was a little hunting lodge of Louis XIII and Louis XIV began to change it from the 1660s. And until the end of his reign, the Royal Chapel is the last big project and that was finished in 1710. So you have this period of time, which is a big, big, big building uh, moment of Versailles with the two huge wings. And so I would say that was the main uh, period. So that, that makes about 50 years. And the other building related question was how much marble is there in Versailles and the, the surrounding area? How much marble? So you mean what weight of marble? I've mean, never tried yeah, to calculate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would suppose in thousands of tons of marble and all, all the most precious uh, varieties that you could find in Europe at, at that time, Carrara and then, uh, antique Greek, uh, green and uh, Campan is very present. We have a lot of Campan, that's the green marble of the chimney here, for instance. Um, but it, there's marble everywhere. In fact, uh, the floors were made of wood with the famous Versailles uh, wood floor, big, only when a marble floor was too heavy and was not possible in the building. Otherwise, I think we would have marble floors everywhere. Amazing. And then uh, there's, and there's more marble in the gardens, the fountains, the sculptures. I mean, it's, it's hundreds of marble sculptures. So it's really the temple of marble here. <laughs> um, great. So we have time for about two more questions. Um, so the first one is from Patrick, who wants to know what types of renovations you typically do there versus are there some objects that are original that are just maybe too challenging to restore or ones that you haven't restored? Well, a uh, very interesting question. This has changed uh, over the time. At, and for instance, in the 50s and 60s of the 20th century, uh, there were huge projects of restitution of complete uh, atmospheres. So that would include the, the fabrics and the textile decoration, um, trying to acquire furniture or having replicas of furniture when it was needed. For instance, in, in the Hall of Mirrors, you have some of the chandeliers, I mean, those women holding the, um, the lights uh, are copies from the originals um, in the collection. Now we're doing that less and less and we try to focus on the originals. So we really try to acquire authentic objects uh, whenever we can. And also we are restoring, trying to show as much as, the, uh, as we can of the, the original parts. We are not trying to recreate too much. But from the end of the 19th century, there was a frenzy of recreating Versailles and lots of debates and, and controversies about are we going too far? And there were fights between the curators. I mean, I represent more the curators and the architects who are in charge of Re renovating but sometimes also rebuilding and redesigning we have projects that, that were never done but of recreating uh, entire buildings of the park which have disappeared it's fascinating um last question that we have time for today is from julie who wants to know how do you go about cleaning the palace 
Well, we do that all the time. <laughs> so it's one of our main challenges. It's very difficult to clean the palace because it means cleaning floors, marbles, but also precious carpets, precious fabrics, um, um, cabinets, and very different types of materials. So we have lots of different categories of people working on this. Um, up to the more most specialized uh, conservators. So cleaning for us is uh, the word is too simple to to tell what we're doing here. It's cleaning, um, looking after objects. We, it's also very important to to just look at them and see how they age and how they feel. We also have people, a special staff for clocks, because we have hundreds of clocks, of course, in, in this palace. I think you've heard them ring sometimes. Um, so it's, it's, and we need to clean them, of course, also. So all the different ways to clean something we know here in, in Versailles. Amazing. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, Laurent, I would have loved to take you up on your, your offer to visit Versailles for two months to fully experience it. I'm sure yeah. everyone on the line has a lot <laughs> more to experience on their next visit. Um, this virtual experience was part of the Tickets Awakening Weeks, which is a six-week celebration of the reopening of more than 100 museums and attractions in six countries around the world. Um, if you're in France, you can visit Versailles in person, experience the reawakening in person. Uh, you can visit tickets.com slash blog slash Awakening Weeks for more information on all of these Awakening Weeks around the world and online experiences and in-person activities to do at all of the venues. And you can, of course, follow Versailles on social media for more behind the scenes views like this and insider looks at all the fabulous details of Versailles we haven't gotten to cover today. So thank you so much, Laurent. It was- Thank you very pleasure. much for your attention. Hope to see you soon. Yes, uh, we look forward to finding more ways to experience culture with, with everyone on the line again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.